Welcome to the Precious Testimonies broadcast. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. In the Old Testament book of Psalm, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, Precious Testimonies has been called of God to do just that. And we're to do that by giving born-again Christians an opportunity to share what Jesus has done in their lives to the glory of God the Father and, of course, the Holy Spirit and, of course, Jesus himself. And so with that, we're going to let you hear some people sharing how uh, God has worked in their lives and what this Jesus has done for them and what he means to them. And I pray that this will be something God uses to either help you come to uh, a precious relationship with God or grow in your relationship with God. And with that now, let's listen to what uh, some folks have to say about this great and mighty Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. David Lewis was a good child, but something about the streets enticed him. These guys are riding fancy cars. They have all the women. You know, they have all the money. I wanted to be able to have that respect that they had, you know, and uh, have that influence. David eventually realized nothing good would come of this lifestyle, so he decided to enlist in the Army. He was smart and had the potential to rise through the ranks to leadership. Instead, he chose to distinguish himself another way, as a criminal. People would, just to get a few extra bucks, they would go purchase the alcohol and the uh, cigarettes at the military store, and then they would actually go sell them for a huge markup. I didn't think myself above the law because the rationale, the justification is everybody's doing, and nobody gets prosecuted for this. David's small crimes led to bigger heists. If we walked into an area and we saw where there was going to be a huge amount of cash, you know, we would plan to literally go get that cash. So what's the game plan again? We knew that when uh, soldiers were in the field, back the, in those days before the automatic draft, you got an officer who's got two briefcases, they're full of money, and they've got to go out to this remote area, give them their money, out in the woods. We would simply be out there waiting for them, and we would rob them. Eventually, David was caught and sentenced to 24 years in Fort Leavenworth Military Prison. I got this criminal thing wrong. I want to get it right. I'm in this institution. I've got the best and the worst of the worst around me. You know, and I've got famous people here, you know, the people that you've heard of on the news. I'm just going to just get as much information and much knowledge as I can to become this master criminal when I get out. But the horrible reality of life in prison overwhelmed David. And after five years in Leavenworth, he decided to kill himself. I've got to deal with the, the craziness. I've got to deal with the, the yelling. I've got to deal with the bars closing. I've got to deal with all these issues again, you know. And I had to admit to myself that at that point, I was really tired of it. I actually take my sheet off the bed, tie it up, and uh, make it into a makeshift noose and prepare for my last night on Earth. While I was preparing, I reached over and grabbed my headsets and this song by Lionel Richie, called Jesus is love. It comes on. And all my life I've heard that, you know, Jesus, you know, he loves you. He won't let you down. And this particular night, it, it reached somewhere deep to my core. David began to pray. I'm just there crying, bawling like a baby, admitting some ugly truths about myself, talking to God for the very first time, really talking to God. I'm at the lowest point in my life. But if you get me through this, I am going to, as best as I can, have an impact on everybody that I come in contact with. When that cell door opened the next morning, for the very first time, I was free. And I was free inside of prison. 
As David grew in his newfound faith, he began to encourage other inmates. We started a little believers group, you know, and we would minister to folks while we were there. After David served an eight-year sentence, he was released. Today, he visits prisons to share his testimony with the inmates. David has made a great impact here at Richmond City Jail. Uh, we love him, we care about him because we know that he actually cares. He knows the role of being in here and it gives the residents here at Richmond City Jail hope that they can follow in his footsteps. And when David came, he inspired me. You had to change your mind thinking and let God cut you as a diamond. So when I surrendered, I found myself being a blessing to the guys at the jail. Being in prison is not just a physical thing, you know, because um, it's, it's about being trapped in your circumstances. The devil had me in his crosshairs and he was trying to take me out, you know, and it would have been just another life unfulfilled. God, he means everything to me. He was patient enough to love me when I didn't love myself. He was patient enough to accept me when I finally came to my sentence. The example that I'm trying to set inspires somebody to say, you know what, I may be trapped by something, but if God can do this for him, then surely he can do it for me. I started stealing at nine, and I started uh, skipping school at 11 years old. And um, then I started drinking at 12 and then using marijuana at 13. And I was so out of control that my mom thought it would be best if she could keep an eye on me. And so she took me to work with her. And there I learned how to uh, make money and stripping. Carol Rogers' father went to prison when she was a toddler. Her mother spent her time working at nightclubs. I was around a bunch of burlesque dancers and they were all prostitutes and strippers and and they just taught me how to sell my body. I was taught how to, you know, drink and feel good and loosen up and we took pills at first and um and I drank a lot, of course, because I was real shy back then. By the time I was 15, I was doing it on my own and selling, you know, my body for a lot of money. Carol's destructive behavior was rooted in the sexual abuse she suffered at the hands of her stepfather. It started when she was only five. I just hated myself. I was very angry from all the stuff that happened to me as a child. I was always trying to hurt myself. I was ashamed of myself. I, I cut my wrists. That's the way I was releasing some of the pain, was just cutting my wrist and, and crying and, and just wanting people to love me, and I could not get that love from anybody. I married um, at the age of 21, and um, we fought all the way to the <laughs> to the justice of the peace. Uh, he was verbally abusive and I was strung out on amphetamines. Two years later, Carol separated from her husband. In the years to follow, she drifted from one man to the next. Still working as a stripper and prostitute, she also started manufacturing drugs with her new boyfriend. And she continued cutting. I had sores all over me from head to toe, just literally inflicting pain on myself because of all the emptiness that I felt on the inside. At the time, Carol had four children. Because of her drug addiction, she sent her four children away to live with relatives. You know, in my innermost being, I really wanted to be a good mother because of all the abuse that I experienced as a child. I wanted to be that mother, but I did not know how. I really hated what I did to my children and just, just not being there for them and just leaving them behind. And I really believe that that was a breaking point. After years of run-ins with the cops for prostitution and drugs, Carol finally went to prison for a DWI. In prison, one of her cellmates invited her to a church service. This girl said, hey, you want to come to this service? She asked me what I needed prayer for, and I asked her to pray for me that I didn't want to be a stripper anymore and I just wanted a relationship with my children. I knew that I needed so much forgiveness and uh, 
she prayed for me and literally whenever she was just praying for me, I felt something on the inside change. My heart was literally just could feel something just like God supernaturally softening up my heart. I started reading the Word of God, and I got it on my bunk, and I said, God, if you are real, I will serve you for the rest of my life. I had to have that confirming Word, and from that day on, He just swept me off my feet like I was a princess. And I'll never forget that day, just him touching me. I mean, day after day for a whole year in prison, he made me feel like I was his princess. I got out of prison. I stayed there a year flat. And as soon as I got out of prison, I got in church. Only God could feel that emptiness that I was trying to feel through men, through drugs, through alcohol. It didn't work. And the emptiness, only God could feel that void. In 2000, Carol married again, this time one of the pastors from her church. She is reunited with all of her children. Today, Carol is a chaplain at a county jail. The girls in prison said, Oh, Carol, you'll be back. You'll be back preaching to all these prisoners. And I said, I am not coming back here. You know, I, there's no way I'm coming back. And um, years later, after being in church, I knew that after I was off parole that I could go and serve in prison ministry. It's just such a blessing to go back in and talk to the prostitutes, the drug addicts, the, the women that have lost their children, and where they think that there is no hope. And when I go in there, I give them the hope of Christ. You know, if He can do it for me, I know He can do it for them. My name's God. A lot of people used to call me Face because tattoos all over my face and all that. Um, but I'm locked up for uh, attempted murder. And uh, what drove me to the crime that I did was off in the occult. You know, I had, um, I had put on the mentality of wanting to be a serial killer because the films I was watching, you know, like Friday the 13th and stuff like that. So, I mean, growing up watching these things, you know, it just drove into my mind. And um, that's what drove me there. Well, I got arrested four days after I committed this crime and um, c carried on for, for at least like 15 years, about 15 years still studying the occult, even in prison, and um, even set up my own altars in my cell, you know, just honoring Satan. At the, but in satanic knowledge, it's um, satisfying your ego. Satan is your ego. And by satisfying your ego, you automatically satisfying yourself so it's really a self-worship but um it wasn't until um uh, by 2006 when um i started reading a uh, a series called left behind series and i didn't even make uh, my my first chapter of the left behind series is just man some questions start coming to me like man is man is this really true man what these people are saying I mean, uh, the rapture, come on, pe people disappearing. Man, I wonder how true it is. I don't, I don't know, I have no knowledge of this or anything, you know. It's just, man, something I'm reading, saying, is, is basically fact from uh, the Bible. So it took me to the Bible, saying, man, just out of curiosity. And by reading the Word of God, and, you know, it just made me right at I-60 to uh, the chaplain department, which it, which lied on, uh, I mailed it out on Thursday morning. And uh, God blessed me to meet a, a, a good man that really brought me to the faith, which is Sam Rushings. He's part of the Mike Barber ministry. And um, the, fo the following Thursday, he told me to uh, bring my literature. I mean, I had literature on uh, my black book, which I call Black Book. And uh, the, this inside this this um, book of mine, it had sacrificial um, uh, rituals. Well, I mentioned that um, I met this guy out there, 
and um, he, I, I started kicking it with him, but and he started producing this uh, literature like Satanic Bible, Satanic Rituals. He also uh, introduced me to a lot of his literature that throughout his traditions, and he just invited me one day, well, one night, you know, into the woods where they had, had held the uh, black masses at, and um, right there, I mean. When I went, it just out of like I said, wickedness. I already loved wicked, you know, by the movies I'm watching and all that, man. And when the rituals took place, I mean, my my full focus was on it. I started getting tattoos because I wanted to ex express to others who I am, what I am, you know. It, I, I mean, at this time, I mean. I was known to be Antichrist, you know, that's the reason why I got horns and thorns and flames and all that because uh, quite a few people looked at me as being the Antichrist. My relationship in Jesus, man, is great. I mean, I'm sometimes, I was a dude that didn't have no love, no compassion. I mean, you cannot for me. You do wrong to me, I would never forgive you. Matter of fact, I, I would be do my best to get in my chambers and to and uh, try to curse you, you know. But man, after after uh, finding and reading and learning about the Word of God and seeing how powerful it is, that's what changed me. The, my, our Heavenly Father has sent me to His Son. See, I feel I feel a lot of people, especially dealing with Satanism, it's already known that manly flesh living in the carnal state, you automatically want to fulfill your desires. You know, the, the, the temptation that comes to you, the, the desires that come to you, you want to fulfill them. And that's really Satanism. When, when uh, youngsters, young kids or something come and um, start getting this, man, they want to fulfill their carnal state. You know, and uh, they don't want to go beyond because, man, this carnal state is just temporarily. You know, that's what we all need to realize, you know, that that there is an end, you know, and why hold on to something that's temporarily? Why not go beyond that? You know, I mean, I didn't really start experiencing God in my life until I accepted Christ, until I said, man, whatever it is. I'm gonna focus on Christ. You know, I mean, he, he taught me love. He, he taught me forgiving, you know? And um, yeah, we go through hard times. You know, even as Christ, uh, Christians, you know? We go through hard times, temptation gonna come. That's the reason why we need to put on the whole armor of God. That's the reason why we need to rebuke in the name of the Lord. That's the reason why we need to uh, uh, speak the scriptures like Jesus did when he was tempted in, in the wilderness. He fought Satan by the words of God, you know, using scripture. And that's what we need to do. And I encourage every single body, everybody that's listening, man, that man, it might, it's, sometimes you're gonna go through trials and tribulations. That's where, that's where the faith, your faith is gonna really show. And that's where Christ really should shine in the times of hardship. People gonna look at that and gonna say, man, this man right here is a man of God. And if it, man, look at the hardship. He is, his, his faith is still there. His faith in his God is still there. I know because, man, I'm telling you, my life has been wonderful. Man, I, I went from, from going straight to hell to, to, man, as soon as I die, I know Jesus is going to receive my spirit. When I met Peter, I was, uh, I would consider myself a naive uh, 21 year old. When I met him, he wasn't a Christian as yet, but he did say that he wants to be a Christian one day. He was a bit confused with um, the idea of, you know, wanting a godly woman, but not wanting to be a godly man himself. I had this calling on my life to um, be evangelist. I felt that strongly. And when my heart got too involved with Peter, this is when I found out his real beliefs. Peter firmly believed that women were to be seen and not heard in churches. It hurt my heart because I thought that I was hearing God's voice, 
the whole time. Peter invited Tanika to visit him out of town one weekend. She agreed, not knowing what he had planned when she arrived. I trusted him. I trusted him. He told me there would be um, a hotel room for myself and he wouldn't be there, you know? I trusted that. And, um, you know, he came in, it was late, it was like 11 o'clock, and he came in and I seen that he was staying. And I said, well, aren't you going? And he said he's just going to stay for a while. And I, I went in my, in, in, into bed and he came into the bed with me and I said, you know, what are you doing? He said, don't worry, don't worry, nothing's going to happen, nothing's going to happen. And I trusted him and we laid there and then I trusted him. And he, but he kept on saying to justify what he was doing was, I'm going to marry you. I'm going to marry you. I'm going to marry you. I waited. I was waiting for my wedding, for my wedding day. And I feel that he was. He just stole, stole that, up, that, that dream from me. My my health started to plummet into this place of depression. My face was broken out all over. The entire face was filled with acne. It was so bad. I stopped um, washing my clothes. I stopped combing my hair. I stopped calling my good friends because I didn't want them to see, see me. I just felt so dirty. I felt hopeless. My dad called for, called from Jamaica and he told my mom, you need to bring her to, to Mount Sinai psychiatric ward. At this point, Tanika had barely slept for seven months and wasn't eating. In her confused state, she believed that the only way out of depression was to marry Peter. Plans were made and she was three days away from leaving when a phone call changed everything. And on a Monday, I got a phone call from a girlfriend of mine. She said, I want you to call Peter and I want you to tell him it's over. And I just believed that God was using this woman I got off the phone with her and I mustered up all the strength that I could have to call Peter. And I said, Peter, it's over. I can't give you all the details right now, but all I can tell you is that it's over. Our relationship is over. It's not God's will. I went on my knees. And then what I seen, almost like a vision, something turned and looked at me. And I knew it was God, but he was just waiting for me to cry out to him. Today, Tanika shares her story with audiences all over North America, and has even written a book about her experience, which has a very happy ending. When I met Robert Chambers, who's my husband, who's my Boaz, it seemed like, like a dream come true. He was everything that I could ever ask for. Just his faith in God blew me away. He had everything I was looking for in a husband. He was sensitive to my feelings. He was more than what I could ever ask for in a husband. God is a restorer. So if you think you've messed up along the way and God can't bless you with your Boaz still, it can happen. But there is a requirement. God just asks us to be willing and obedient to follow him, to trust him, allow him to be your guide. Manny Mill was only three when Castro came into power in Cuba. His family lost everything under the communist government and eventually fled to America. His mother was Roman Catholic, but she was also involved in a cult called Santa Ria. My mom was a witch, to put it plainly. In Cuba, the Roman Catholic Church, many of the statues that they had, the Cuban people took that in the wrong way and they were worshipping the idols or the statues and they didn't really know how to worship God so she was a medium to all these demons that went through her. Then one of the other mediums in the cult became a Christian. She began to witness to my mother and after a while my mother said okay I'm gonna go with you to church and she heard the gospel message that Jesus died for her sins and she asked God to forgive her. That night, she got home and she cleansed the house. 
everything was broken, everything was dumped. Manny's mother prayed for everyone in her family to become Christians. None were very receptive. I thought that my mother was nuts, you know, because I was under the false impression that if there was a God, I was it. Manny married and had kids, but he wasn't exactly a family man. I was a womanizer. I was the mayor's aide for the city of Union City, New Jersey. I was the, one of the top salesmen for the company called Prudential. I used to run Latin shows and Latin cruises. I had four cars. I had a hundred suits. I was a great dancer. I even had hair at that time, you know. So I wanted to them all. I wanted the sex, I wanted the power, and I wanted the money, you know. So somebody came to me with this scheme, with this deal, and it looked easy for me. And my only job was to find a banker that will allow me to have a checking account and to deposit the money there. And I thought I had committed the perfect crime. Manny's perfect crime turned out not to be so perfect. The FBI went to the bank to investigate, and the person that was not supposed to talk, talked. So they began to look for me, and I didn't want to meet with them, so I began to run. Manny packed up his son and pregnant wife and told them they were going on a vacation. And I began to go from country to country, and finally I went to Venezuela. Manny opened a Cuban restaurant. Nearly two years later, he got a phone call from his father. He said, Manolito, the FBI came to see me, and I know why you are there. You are there because you stole money. Let me ask and he said, let me ask you a question. If I die tonight, could you come to my wake? Could you come to my funeral? When I began to just picture the fact that I could see my father on a casket, you know, I began to weep. But my mother was on the other phone, and she began to Give me the gospel. Manolito, you have sinned against a holy God. He loves you. He wants to forgive you, but you need to repent from your sins. And she gave me the whole package of the gospel. And when she did that, is that the Holy Spirit used those words from God's word and awakened me. Now I was able to see my sin. I was able to see this holy God. I realized that I was a sinner. And apart from Jesus, I cannot make it. I repented, and my father and I became Christians at the same time. Manny's mother had one more question. My mother asked me, Manolito, when are you going to come back? <laughs> I was so naive, and I was so new. I said, believe it. I said, oh, that wasn't part of the deal, you know? <laughs> so she gave me my first biblical verse, Hebrew 13, 5. She said, Manolito, God's word says that he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And that verse really gave me a, a glimpse of courage to be able to come back and face the music. Within two weeks, I left everything behind and I turned myself in. And the FBI was waiting for me. They made me at the gate. Manny was arrested and pled guilty to charges of interstate transportation of forged checks. He was sentenced to three years in prison out of a possible 55. So I went to prison for almost two years. While I was there, God shaped me and used me in a powerful way. I became a leader within the church, inside. It was also a time of struggle. While he was in prison, his wife divorced him. But Manny hung on to the promise of a bright future. Then he heard about a new scholarship program at Wheaton College for former inmates. However, you had to be out, but I was still locked up. And I still had many months to do. Manny filled out the application anyway. He was surprised when he was released from prison early and in time to start his first semester at Wheaton. Manny spent his last semester studying in Jerusalem. Got did a miracle there. And the fact is that they allowed me to go on this trip on parole. And on the last day of my federal parole, I met Barbara. Manny and Barbara have been married nearly 20 years. 
Manny is an ordained minister and executive director of Koinonia House, a ministry to Christian inmates on their release from prison. God used what I used for evil to make it now for his glory. And the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. You know. So we want to we want to make sure that our lives count every day, not for ourselves, but for the glory of God. I can remember being five and getting my first Christmas gift um, from school, a purple and white unicorn. Cynthia Cooper's father didn't allow gifts or celebrations. And when he got home, he immediately threw it in the trash. And I remember being crushed um, because I didn't understand. Cynthia Cooper's father and mother were Jehovah's Witnesses. Her father was an elder of the faith and strictly enforced all the rules of the religion. No celebration of holidays, birthdays, Christmas. Jesus Christ was simply a prophet, um, you know, who came to the earth. They don't believe that. God is able to talk to you. As a child, Cynthia was independent and curious. She struggled to understand her father's religion. I would ask him questions and a lot of the questions he wouldn't answer or he'd get frustrated with me and he pretty much his response was because I said so. I felt very left out at school. I felt very isolated. Um, there was really no outside influence or opportunity to be social outside of uh, the members of the church. Cynthia carried her loneliness, doubts and questions into her teens. She dreaded the exhausting work required by the religion. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that um, you can get your salvation through works. And so the more hours you have in field service, the more doors you knock on, the more new converts, the more valuable you are to the Kingdom Home. The older I got, I would play sick every Saturday. I'm not going out in field service. You know, uh, just any little way that I could avoid, um, you know, doing the works of the Kingdom. The more work her parents did for Kingdom Hall, the more Cynthia rebelled. I pushed the envelope more. I went out and I did whatever I thought I was big and bad enough to do. Uh, sneaking out with my boyfriend, going places I had no permission. When Cynthia was 13, her older sister married a man who was not a Jehovah's Witness. Her sister's actions and her parents' reaction finally brought Cynthia to a breaking point with the religion. My parents had literally thrown all of my sister's clothes out on the front lawn because she had gotten married. I just began to, to think, you know, this is your child. How can you say you love your child and you love God? You know, but you're treating your child this way. I just began to question. It was just something inside of me that just said, this is not the love of God. So I began to search for God. Cynthia secretly prayed to God and asked him to reveal himself. To talk to God for the first time was foreign because, you know, the Jehovah's Witness had taught me that God doesn't speak to people. So, you know, here I am talking to this God that can't hear me. I don't know if he can hear me. Then, in her junior year of high school, she experienced something she'd been taught could never happen. She believed she heard the voice of God. I actually had a pinched nerve, and at the time, no one knew what it was. So I said, Lord, if you heal me, you know, I'll serve you. I don't know who you are. I don't know how to serve you, but if you heal me, I will. I heard the Holy Spirit say, okay. And so I turned my neck and something snapped in the side of my neck and immediately I was healed. And you know, I knew it was him. And then immediately the peace that I felt once that came over me, uh, it was awesome. Cynthia kept her personal experiences with God a secret until she moved out of her parents' home. She knew there would be grave consequences. When she was 19 and living independently, she denounced the Jehovah's Witness religion. I wrote a letter to one of the elders of the congregation and I told them that I no longer wish to be a witness. Um, I heard later on that they publicly uh, disowned me uh, at the service. So did Cynthia's parents. When my parents disowned me, it was devastating. And I remember my dad calling me out of my name, telling me I was not welcome. And it just, it crushed me. There were so many different emotions, but one thing that I kept in the back of my mind is that I had heard the voice of God. So if, if anything happens, I knew he talked to me when he healed me. So that was what kept me going. 
A couple of months later, Cynthia met a pastor at a local gym, and he invited her to church. Because of his invitation, she attended a Christian church for the first time in her life. At first, she was afraid. I had been taught that all other churches were tied up with Satan the devil, and to go in and embrace that would be basically worshiping the devil. But there was such a peace that came over me that I knew it was God and I knew it was Him leading me. I didn't know how, but I knew it was. That day, Cynthia learned about Jesus and His plan of salvation. Cynthia gave her life to Christ. When I first got saved and I asked Christ into my heart, I felt clean. It was like um, going to the altar, it, was, it felt like I was being rinsed of everything. So it was a, it was a freeing experience. It was, um, it was indescribable. Cynthia's new faith was genuine, but her conversion to Christianity only widened the gap between her and her family. I fell into a deep depression, and I can remember having a bottle of pills, and I called one of my friends, and I basically told him goodbye because I was planning on killing myself. And right before that happened, he knocked on the door, thank God, and he prayed me out of that depression. With the support of her church, Cynthia drew on God's strength and encouragement. Her victory over depression came when she started reading the Bible and memorizing scriptures. Cynthia says her hardships only made her faith stronger. I learned so much about who Jesus was. Um, from my provider, my comforter when I was lonely. He was my peace, um, you know, when my mind would try to be confused. You know, he's been my mother, he's been my father. He's been everything to me. Today, Cynthia is still estranged from her family, but she has forgiven them and prays for them. She shares her life-changing story in her book, The Cost of My Salvation. There's definitely a difference between religion and relationship. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I live my life based on the relationship because I want to be pleasing to Him. And that's so absent from the rituals that come with religion, there's no comparison. If there's someone today watching and you want Jesus and maybe you were taught that He's just a prophet, I would encourage you today to just invite Him into your heart. His blood is more powerful than anything. His spirit is more powerful than anything. So if you really want to seek Him, and if you diligently seek Him, He will find you. When I was 16 years old, I had a, a very bad car wreck, and my best friend at the time uh, was in the back seat, and we got T-boned, and it split my car in half. My buddy got airlifted, and he was in a coma for three months, and uh, for three months, I didn't know if he was going to live or die. I put a lot of guilt on me, a lot of shame on me, thinking it was my fault. I just got mad at God, and I turned on God, and I said, I hate you, God, and I just said, forget living for God. I'm going to do my own thing. So the only way I knew how to numb the pain and how to deal with all this was to start partying. And I saw drugs as a way out. It just wasn't enough. It, it wasn't enough fun. It wasn't enough drugs. All of a sudden, I wake up two years from then, and I'm snorting cocaine. I'm doing Oxycontin. I supported my drug habit by stealing, selling drugs, however I could do it. I lived in fear a lot, thinking, man, these drugs should really mess me up one night. You know, I might have an overdose or I might do a drug that I shouldn't do. And I, I always lived in fear because I always knew what I should be doing. I always knew I should be living for God. I was doing drugs while I was playing high school basketball. I was even more hooked in college on drugs. I, I lived such a double life where I had my coaches fooled, my parents fooled. They thought I was a good kid. Um, but on the side, all my friends knew me as, as a drug addict. I was at rock bottom and I knew I had to go somewhere. Something had to change in my life. And I can remember walking into a church service called The Basement. I felt the presence of God for the first time in my whole life. And I felt God speak to my heart. And he said, Casey, he said, there's a heaven and there's a hell. Which one are you going to choose? I had been running from the call that God had on my life. I knew that God was real and I needed to get it right that night. And I didn't want to leave there without him. I went up front to the altar. And I can remember crying out to God, just bowing down and crying and saying, God, if you can take these drugs away from me, if you can somehow clean me up, I know I'm a mess, I know I'm dirty, I know I'm a screw up and I've messed up.
but if you can somehow change my life and fix me, I'll serve you to the day I die. And I gave my life to the Lord and I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And man, the coolest thing about it is I walked in that church a drug addict, but I didn't need a six month plan, no eighth month rehab. I made a one step to Jesus plan and he saved me, he delivered me, he set me free. And one night I have never been the same since. That night after, after the service, after I had an encounter with God, I remember calling a couple of my old buddies and I said, look man, I can't hang out with you no more. Uh, I got saved tonight. If you want to hang out, you can come with me to church. Even after all the partying and all the drugs and all the cocaine and the wild stuff I've done, God still loved me. God still had a plan for me. He still wanted to use me. He didn't give up on me. I had an encounter with God and I had a satisfaction inside of me that I can't explain that I've never had before, that no drugs, no high have ever gotten me. I've never been so passionate about anything in my life as I am for God. Diane Partain was born into what appeared to be a normal American family. Everybody that would look at my family would always feel like, you know, oh, what a wonderful family. You know, you got such a cool mom, such a cool dad. It looked so normal and so happy. Underneath all that, you know, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't live in intense fear, uh, intense darkness and loneliness and isolation. From the time Diane was three years old, she was raped by a male family member. She never told anyone out of fear of retribution, which grew worse as she got older. It caused me intense fear. I felt like love from a man, affection from a man did nothing but hurt. The sexual abuse caused me to um, be very confused about men. I felt like all men were hurting all women everywhere. I just all of a sudden made a decision because I was afraid of men and comfortable with women. Then I obviously was a lesbian. I hardly even knew what that meant, actually. I didn't really ever put a title on what I was feeling for many years because I didn't really know how to describe it. I just knew that I didn't feel safe with men. I did feel safe with women. And I wanted to be with a woman. I didn't like who I thought I was. I didn't feel normal. I didn't fit in. I felt like if people knew who I was and what I was, they would hate me, that they would look down at me. And because of that, you know, I started doing, like in high school, I started doing uh, amphetamines. I started do, smoking pot. I started turning to all kinds of drugs just to numb that feeling that I was having inside, the feeling of like the fear of rejection. As an adult, she had several relationships with women, but deep down still hated herself. The first thing on my agenda would be to just find some drugs, start using, and all I did from sun up to sundown was just try to stay high, just try to just use as much drugs as possible. In a desperate attempt for attention, Diana slashed her wrists. Even when the paramedics came, they looked at my wrist and they go, this looks like a person that didn't really want to kill themselves, but is just angry and confused and just asking for help. And, and I looked at the paramedics and I told them, I am, I don't really want to die. I just can't continue to live the way I am. The physical wounds healed, but the emotional scars remained. A new coworker sensed her despair and persuaded Diane to come to church. Diane did and asked Jesus Christ into her life. She rejected her homosexual lifestyle and stopped doing drugs. But it wasn't long until she was back to her old addictions. The self-hate ran so deep that one Sunday morning, Diane found herself begging God to end her life. I just prayed, God, I said, I'm not sure if it's a sin to kill myself, and so I don't want to have to do that. But I, I, I told him I couldn't take it anymore, that I couldn't live another day the way that I was. And I just begged him. I mean, I begged him. I mean, I was on my knees sobbing and just from the just from the bowels of my inside, just begging him to please take me. At that moment, God heard Diane's cry. Diane says an overwhelming sense of love filled her heart. I saw myself as not Diane the drug addict, Diane the lesbian, Diane the unloved, unlovely person, Diane the ugly person. I saw myself as Diane, the whole, the whole and complete child that he created me to be. I got in the car and went to this little church and went busting through the doors going, praise God, I've been set free from drugs and alcohol and lesbianism. <laughs> and I mean, I was, you know, they let me get up and share my testimony right away. They received me in love. Diane's friend from work taught her to read the Bible and get involved in church. Diane also learned that she needed to forgive the family member who had abused her as a child. 
I was set free for the first time. I felt like this newfound freedom, and it was just just through forgiveness. Through forgiveness, I felt like I was given a new lease on life, you know, a fresh start in life. It was extremely important. Today, Diane is happily married and living each day with Christ the center of her life. I know that I love Him more than anything in this world. I know that I've surrendered my life to Him, and I've given Him myself. I, I couldn't imagine walking out of that. I couldn't imagine leaving His hands, leaving His safety, just knowing that the, that God, the creator of this universe, that spoke everything into his existence is my dad. He's my papa and he loves me and I love him. And there's, there's nothing in this world that can compare to that, nothing. With all the success, with all the women, with all the money, it still wasn't enough, the void was there. Kent Bryant worked as a scout for one of the hottest record labels in New York City. But this wasn't his first career choice. At age 12, he was already six foot three inches tall. His dream was to become a superstar in the NBA. It was a thrill of a lifetime, you know, to play basketball and to enjoy it and, and just to have that great competition. By his senior year, he became high school All-American, which guaranteed a full ride at a number of Division I universities. He decided on San Diego State. Just having the ability to shoot the basketball and to drive to the basket was just one of my specialties. And, you know, they used to call me K-Swish. You know, I used to, used to drop in that net at all times. But instead of focusing on basketball and his grades, Kent turned his attention to other pursuits. By the time he graduated from college, he'd become a drug dealer. My friends and the people that I hung out with called me the pharmacist. And uh, that was, that name was given to me because I really knew how to dice it up and serve it up well. Kent lost his shot at the NBA and with it his dream of superstardom. And the thousands of dollars a week he was making as a dealer did little to fill a growing emptiness inside. So he started using the drugs he sold. Drugs just kept me numb, you know, just drinking and smoking and sniffing cocaine and just living a crazy lifestyle and just uh, blacking out, you know, meeting a girl at a club or at a bar or something and just going home with her or going to a hotel. And One day, Kent was introduced to Sean P. Diddy Combs, who was in the beginning stages of starting Bad Boy Records. Kent joined the company as a scout to develop and promote new music artists. Working with Diddy brought a new kind of high. Music industry, bad boy entertainment, it was fast paced. A lot was coming at you all the time. A lot of success, a lot of fame. Working with such artists as the Notorious B.I.G., Faith Evans, Craig Mack, the list just goes on and on. You can throw a party and have your artists come and charge at the door and you can make up to thirty to forty thousand dollars on a given night. Kent's tenacity and ability to develop new talent earned him the name Top Dog. He loved the lavish lifestyle that came with the title, but one morning, after an all-night party, he came face to face with how bankrupt his life had become. This suicidal thought just came to me, like, you know, here you are. Everything that you felt that you desired, that you needed, with drugs, with money, with women, with notoriety, everything you have but yet there was still this void this this emptiness when I grabbed this rail and I'm looking over and I'm ready to just jump and then I just heard a voice and I have a plan for you you know I, I have work for you no no you don't want to do that and it was as if hands were just pushing me back from the rail less than a month later Kent became seriously ill in two days he lost 22 pounds the destructive life that I led and, and, and sleeping with so many different women and having unprotected sex. I thought, I thought I had the AIDS virus. I thought I was dying. At the hospital, Kent discovered that he didn't have AIDS, but a bad case of food poisoning. While recovering at home, his friend Steve paid him a visit. I started talking to him and I told him that I got saved. And he didn't really understand what saved meant, so he thought that maybe I had some beef on the street. And I said, saved from who? You had problems in the street and you didn't come and get me? Then I explained to him that saved meant Jesus saved me from my sins. And I gave my heart to the Lord and, you know, I'm, I'm going to church now. And he had a Bible in his hand and he opened the Bible up and he read John 3.16 to me, started reading other scriptures. And I'm looking at him like, 
Steve, the same guy I used to do drugs with and run with in the music industry, and he's talking to me about Jesus. I was like, Kent, God is real and he, and he loves us and, and he wants you to know him. And I told him that God had me praying for him and God sent me here to tell him about the gospel. And he started to listen. Kent quit his job at Bad Boy Records and began to read the Bible. Here it is, a thug, a dude from the music industry, and a drug addict, and I left all of that behind. I'm reading the Bible now, staying up all night, reading book after book, studying, looking up words. Then one Sunday, Kent went to church and surrendered his life to God. Went straight to the altar, and I remember getting ready. These two brothers came and they approached me and they laid their hands on me and they started to pray. But I started to pray for myself and I started to talk to God for myself. And I lifted my hands and I said, God, if you can take away this lust within me, I'll give you my life. And these guys, their, their voices just dwindled away. I didn't hear them anymore. And I had a, a divine encounter with God right there. And the Holy Spirit filled me, took away my sin, my shame, my guilt, everything that I was struggling with, forgave me of everything that I did. And it was as if God himself embraced me. I was different. I was changed right there in a moment. Here I am, nine and a half years later, happily married. And God has so kept me. And I can tell you this, that the Lord is so awesome that I've never cheated on my wife. Never. From the lifestyle that I led. That is the most powerful part of my testimony to me. Because I know, I know the things that I did. And I know the lifestyle that I led, and he has kept me. He's kept me. Today, Ken is in full-time ministry. He travels around the country with Urban Impact, sharing his testimony and holding basketball clinics for at-risk youth. Jesus has a plan for our lives, no matter what rock you crawled out from up under, no matter what lifestyle that you were in, how much sin you committed, God is big enough and strong enough to forgive you and to show you his plan for your life. One of my, uh, one of my favorite things to do when I met Christians was to give them a hard time. People, I wanted to know, why do you think that, that God exists? Because I didn't believe that God existed. You know, they did their best to answer my questions, and when they got to questions they couldn't answer, the answer was, I don't know how to answer your question, but this is what I believe, and it changed my life. That was the first time I'd ever heard that from someone. It's a rather unique response. So I grew up in a home with, with um, non-believers. My father is agnostic, atheist. I mean, it varies from day to day. Uh, they're da my family's Danish, and Danes are not known for their uh, overwhelming evangelical faith, to put it mildly. And uh, I picked up that. I mean, that, that's the way I was raised. I never went to church with my parents, ever. I really rarely went to church with anyone, and I had no, I had no training and no background in, in Christianity or in faith in general as a child. So at, at 32 years old, I, I met for the first time in my life uh, Christians who didn't back down under my pressure. I was quite antagonistic. I was, I was hostile towards Christians and Christianity, and I would go after people ferociously when I found out that they were Christians, when they professed to be Christians, which 90% of the time meant nothing, actually, because they wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even begin to stand up to my pressure. And then I met people who, who did, who stood up to that pressure, not in a harsh way, but in a loving way. You know, they, they did their best to answer the questions I had, and when they couldn't answer my questions, they told me that, well, this is what Christ has done in my life. This is how I've been transformed because of the, the power of Christ in my life. That's the answer. 
So the first time that I had what I consider to be a clear encounter with God um, was on Weston Avenue in Nashville. I was finished with my PhD. I was uh, trying to raise a family. I was on the job market. It's a stressful time, but it was going really well. But I had, I had, uh, I had a question about my daughter. I was very concerned about her, and I had no answers no ready answers for what to do with her or about her to help her and decided that I was going to test and see if God was really there and I asked God you know if you're real would you answer this question what what am I supposed to do about my daughter and I went to a doctor's appointment I sat down in the waiting room and I had a person sit down behind me and describe my situation to someone else about a different teenager who ultimately committed suicide, which was in fact what I was worried about with respect to my daughter, and then began to discuss the impact of God in his life and the people around him in such a way that it was clear to me that that was God's hand, right? that the probability, from a, from a standpoint of probability, of, of that happening was so low that I couldn't rule out the supernatural. But I had no interest in Jesus, right? I mean, I was hostile to the idea of Jesus. It made no sense to me, but I thought, well, you know, if there's a God, this is something I probably should know. It's rather important. And um, so I went, I went to a church service. It was difficult. I mean, I, I barely made it through worship. I thought I, I wanted to flee. I didn't understand spiritual dimensions, right? The spiritual realm didn't exist as far as I was concerned. There was no God, there was no Satan, no heaven, no hell. Uh, but it, it I wanted out of that room in a way that I could not, I couldn't describe to anyone who hasn't experienced that. Thankfully, I made it through uh, to listen to this pastor come on the screen. He was in another room, and I was, he was being video cast into the sanctuary where I was sitting. And I had been to church once or twice, you know, not with my family, but I don't know how. I ended up at church a couple of times, and, and it had never had any effect on me uh, intellectually. But this person was different. You know, he had a conversation with people in, in his church about how to live their lives in a real way. Um, the, this wasn't preaching in sort of the traditional sense. And, and at one point, you know, he sort of looked through this video screen right at me and said, you really don't need a PhD to figure this out. And I thought, wow, you know, that, that's, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so, I, you know, I... I at that point decided that this was you know this required more investigation right i couldn't rule out the presence of god or the absence of god couldn't be confirmed at this point and i had to be intellectually honest enough to at least keep up that pursuit so i went to small group with the people that uh, had been praying for me and they started a study obviously not on accident a max Licato study about understanding the heart of jesus and so i got my workbook and you know i'm a student i mean, I had a phd by then but i'm a lifelong student i had to do my work so I took this workbook, and um, you know, a, a week or so later, my husband and I boarded a plane for Hawaii for a conference. And on the plane, I'm working through this workbook and reading about Christ and reading about sort of the cross and the significance of the cross. And I realized at that moment that I was refusing to accept the greatest gift that could ever be given, ever. And I had no basis for doing that. I had no reason to reject Christ. You know, I, 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 no one had ever presented the gospel to me in such a way that I understood the, the, the purpose of the cross and the sacrifice that Christ made. And I decided at that second, right there on the plane, sitting next to my husband who had no idea what was going on, that I wasn't going to do that anymore. That, that if this gift were indeed real, I was taking it and I was taking all of it. And so I, you know, I, I don't know what I did in terms of a salvation prayer. I, I don't know that I knew how to do that correctly, but I just told God, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this. Right? If, if Jesus died for me and so I could have some mercy and I can have grace, like I can have forgiveness, it, the, the whole concept is so foreign if you're not accustomed to it. And, I, and the, the sensation immediately when I said that prayer, uh, the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. Literally, I felt the weight of the world leave me. And I can't, I can't explain that rationally. I can't duplicate that, you know, but, but I had no idea how much baggage I had been carrying around for 32 years.
in the projects is quiet by day, but it's loud at night. C.J. Blair grew up in the inner city. His mother worked on the streets, and the only father C.J. ever knew was her pimp. There was no one there to really nurture me and keep me from some of the ills that you encounter just living in, you know, inner city Washington, D.C. Before long, C.J. was selling drugs and running with gangs. My intentions was to get my mother off of a corner. And when you present an opportunity for me to make $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 a night, then I'm connecting that to my mother can stop selling her body and getting beat up by men. But there were some bright spots in his life. He spent his summers at his great-grandmother's house, which had a totally different atmosphere. My great-grandmother believed God for everything. I mean, everything. If it was bread, if it was rent money, whatever it was, she believed it. So she would line me up every night on the side of the bed, and she'd be praying, and, you know, she'd be blessing and so forth and so on, and God keep them. And I was like, wow, this woman is serious. You know, I was the bad guy in the family. I was like the roughest one. But she would never speak as negative about me as the rest of the family. She would always say that I was, you know, a man of God and God gonna do it. And she spoke that in me. While his great grandmother had a strong influence on CJ, he wasn't ready to change. I was scared of hell. I really was scared of hell. And my great grandmother, she really hammered that home. I knew becoming a Christian was going to take me leaving the lifestyle that I had grown accustomed to. So I wasn't going to play with God. CJ dropped out of school and at the age of 13 was arrested for the first time on an assault charge. He spent the next 12 years in and out of jail. Then after serving a six year prison term for robbery and malicious wounding, CJ went into the rap music business with some guys he met in prison. I was in the studio one night and the studio engineer began to talk about Jesus. He said, if it's a Jesus and you haven't accepted him and you die, you're going to be short. And God began to start dealing with me at that point. Just a couple of weeks later, CJ was driving home from a major drug deal. And I'm listening to this rap group and the rap group says that they have platinum currency cards with the mark of the beast on them. When I heard that, something triggered in me. All that talk that my great-grandmother was talking about back then, when I was like eight, nine, here it is now. So immediately, I said, I'm going to hell. And as soon as I thought that, it was like a, a, a bolt hit me. My hands flew up, and I began saying hallelujah, hallelujah. And I heard Jesus say, CJ, audibly, like I'm talking to you right now. CJ, and I said, yes, Lord. And he said, take it out. I popped the tape out the tape deck and started messing with the radio. The guy on the radio said, do you know what miracles are? The radio guy was talking to me, literally. But I knew it was God. I'm scared, because I'm like, I'm getting ready to die. And this is what God do to you before he kill you. He let you know he was real. <laughs> so next thing I know, my hand is grabbing the Coke and throwing it out the window. The marijuana, the cigarettes, everything that my hands touched, it threw out the window. So I remember saying to myself, this better be Jesus. Because I threw away all this money. And these folks going to kill me. When CJ got home, he went down to the basement. And I began to pray. I had never prayed as an adult like that. The next day, my mother had came down there and was like, you know, what happened? What was wrong with you? And I literally just said, I'm saved. I just, I just knew that that was what had happened. I'm saved. CJ turned his life over to God and enrolled in Bible college. He also got rid of his guns. But for an ex-drug dealer in the streets of Washington, he was vulnerable. It wasn't even safe for him to get a haircut. When I was at the barber shop, I was known to tell my barber not to spin me when he cut my hair, but to walk around me and keep me facing the door. Because at that time in the inner city, a lot of young people were getting killed in barbershops. 
and I would face the door, and if anything came through the door do harm to me, I was going to get at it before it got at me. While CJ was getting his hair cut, the dealer he owed money to walked in. This individual was not one that you really wanted to play with. He was a gangster. He would kill you uh, on sight. When he comes through the door, I automatically reach for the gun so I can do something, but I didn't have the gun. The guy walks up on me and he says, I heard you're with Jesus now. And I said, uh, yeah. And he said, pray for me. And he turned around and walked out. And that was a blessing because God really spoke to me and said, I told you I can protect you. Today, CJ is a pastor, ministering in the same streets where he used to hustle drugs. I think people need to see people that have made mistakes, uh, but had one point said yes, and Jesus just came and changed their lives. I live a good life as a result of the gospel, the purpose that God has instilled in my life. I represent the guy that was rebellious, that went to prison, the guy that had been shot, that did all the wrong things. But I show forth his glory because at any moment when there's one word from the Lord that's interjected in your life, all your pain. Before I started coming to the basement, I'd just been in relationships and relationship after relationship. I just couldn't be satisfied. I started drinking and I just got really heavy into it. Almost every night of the week, I was just getting so drunk. I dated this guy and it was I, it was just such an unhealthy relationship. We ended up ending it and it just left me so broken that I just told God I just have nothing else to live for. Um, someone invited me to the basement and they told me about this unconditional love that I've never felt before that I've always been searching for and how God's everything that I need. That night God restored me. He, he made my heart new again and I've just never been so satisfied and now every day like being in the basement and the family I've just I've been able to love and show other girls that this unconditional love that I didn't have. My name's Jay. When I was five years old I lost my dad and I didn't really know where to go. I didn't really have an earthly father at all and it led all the way up to when our mom got remarried to a guy. He seemed all great and got to a point where he started beating her and beating her and got to one day he nearly killed her. And when I was 14 my grandparents adopted me because of that. And leading all through high school, I did drugs, partying, drinking, everything. I did the whole nine yards. And then leading all the way up to when I got in college as a college athlete, I was still doing the same thing, but it got worse. I became an addict and I became a dealer. And I came back home and I was doing the same things and just getting deeper and deeper into it. And then some girl invited me to the basement and I finally came. Um, when I came, Matt just told me his story, he was telling everyone his story. And it was, it was so fire that I wanted what he had. And now I'm just so on fire for God. I've never been the same. Hey, I'm Gabby. When I was about in 10th grade, I lost a bunch of my friends and my boyfriend, and I really didn't think that life was worth living anymore. I didn't think there was anything out there for me, and I tried God, but I never really got used to it, and I didn't know what to do. And so one day I sit in my car, and I just started cutting myself because I thought it would take the pain away, but it didn't, and I just felt worse about it. And um, I got invited to come to the basement, and I've never felt as much love, and just I don't know how to explain it. Like it was amazing. Like everyone was hugging on me and loving on me and treat me like a princess. And I never felt that before. And God's love was so, like, present here. And like I don't even know how to explain it. I love the basement. When I was 14, I was molested by somebody that I went to church with, and I really, I really trusted this person. I, I mean, I babysat their children, so. That for me was really um, devastating because I, I, um, I really was a very good kid. Like I really, really was. But when that happened, it completely changed everything about me. And um, for two years, I didn't um, tell anybody what had happened. Um, I kept it, you know, to myself because I feel like um, I was really scared. And so that was just very devastating to me and that completely changed everything about me. Who I was, how I thought, what I did, where I went, who I hung out with. That's when I started, you know, getting into drugs, started um, dating somebody. You know, my life just completely changed for the worse after that. 
And so, but because I hadn't told anybody for two years, I believe that um, bitterness is the poison you drink while you wait for the other person to die. And um, I, I developed an autoimmune disease because of everything that was going on internally. And um, I started losing all my hair. And um, I basically, by the time I was 16, was pretty much completely bald. Um, I ended up getting raped when I was 18. Um, somebody put, I was at a party and I, you know, it was not like I wasn't, I was somewhere I shouldn't have been, that was for sure. But um, somebody put something in my drink and I ended up getting raped. So after all of that is when my brother, you know, had a drug overdose and it really wasn't a huge shocker to me. I mean, it was devastating because I thought he was going to die, but I knew what he was doing. And um, he ended up moving home and we continued to party together. And then um, it got to the point where my parents, you know, were thinking he was okay and realized he wasn't. And that's when my parents decided it was time for him to go. And the day that my dad was going to um, kick him out of the house, my, my dad led him to the Lord. And so immediately, my brother's like a completely like fired up, let's have a guy's Bible study. And I was like, I really thought he was like faking it. I was like, he, he's faking this. Like, because my brother was the ultimate con when he was, you know, an addict and in that personality, he was, a, he was a con. And so I thought he has pulled one over. Now, I mean, what else would my mother love more than to think, oh, my son's gonna lead a Bible study. Then I began to see like a physical countenance change and everywhere he went, that was all he was talking about. And so um, I was still doing my own thing. I really wasn't involved. I'd be around, but I had my own issues going on. And so I really didn't want to change. Um, but it was like, the more I was around it, the more it was kind of like, I wanted, I wanted it. Whatever they had, I really wanted. And my brother led me to the Lord. And um, for the first time, in my life, I realized that he was real for the first for the first time, and I always I spent all those years blaming God for what had happened to me, and um, so I really didn't want to have anything to do with him for the longest time. Um, but I but I finally realized that day that he was with me. The whole the whole time and I couldn't feel him with me because I wasn't allowing myself to I spent so much time being angry at him when I should have been angry at the devil for taking those things from me it, it really was probably the most amazing day of my life when I was in 10th grade I started getting made fun of and I became really insecure um, I developed an eating disorder I started drinking giving myself away. Um, by my senior year in high school, I was really, really depressed and suicidal, and I was just ready to end it all. Um, I hated myself, I hated my life, and somebody invited me to the basement, and I finally came, because um, I had been hearing all this crazy stuff, and when I walked in, um, Matt was talking, and I just remember the whole service thinking, this is exactly what I need, and I received Christ that night, and God literally saved my life through the basement. I was living a life, um, giving myself away to guys, drinking, partying, popularity, you name it, I was doing it. I went to the basement and he talked about um, how you can find your purity in God again and how if you've messed up, God will forgive you and wash your sins clean and he'll make you brand new and make you a new creation and how he can forgive you and he can be your father because I didn't have a dad anymore and I didn't know how to fill that hole. And, that night, God completely set me free and He changed my life forever. I grew up in church uh, for probably about 17 years, and after that, I, I got with the wrong crowd and started uh, rolling with them. I got, I got into parties, I was doing drugs, I was, I was drinking all the time, I was at a constant high, I couldn't come down, I didn't like being sober. Recently, I had some buddies bring me back into the basement, and uh, it's, changed, it's absolutely changed my life. And I, 
I've actually got it real high now that's every day, 24-7. I don't have to smoke anything. I don't have to take anything. I don't have to, I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to drink anything to feel what I have now. I lived a lifestyle of drinking and partying. Um, I just was really lost and really broken and empty. And I walked into the basement five years ago, and I remember seeing everyone worshiping and praising God. And it really showed me that He's alive and that He's real. I accepted Him into my life that night, and I've never been the same. What's up, guys? My name's Derek. I uh, came to the basement about three years ago and uh, had totally gotten consumed with a life with drugs, alcohol, chasing this girl and that girl, partying, had totally consumed my life. I uh, just came in a mess. Came in, met some guys, they brought me in, man, discipled me, and now I get to live my life for Jesus, something higher than myself. I'm answering the greatest call that I could ever, you know, possibly do, and it's just totally changed my life. My name's Susanna, and when I was 15, I started going through this thing where I was just depressed and I was having all these suicidal thoughts. Well, one day I decided I was just going to Google painless ways to die. And then before that happened, I went to the basement and Matt was just speaking on hope and, and how God has a plan and a purpose for your life. I felt God speak to me and He said, Susanna, I love you and I have a plan and a purpose for your life and I need you here. I don't want you to kill yourself. I need you. And from that day on, I was at the basement every week. I was on fire. I've never been the same since. I had no intentions of living for God. I had so many friends who were just bringing me down. I had no encouragement whatsoever. I had no purpose in my life. And when I got into college, you know, I still carried that with me. And there was so much loneliness and depression. I had an overdose. I overdosed on Oxycontin one night after a big party. And uh, I had a girl invited me to Unashamed one night. And uh, just not even thinking about it, I just, kinda, I just went. And uh, when I walked in the doors, it was something that was so extraordinary. It, was, it changed my life forever. It was the love team. It was the experience. It was God. And no matter what I've done in my life, no matter the loneliness, depression, and everything that I walked in the doors with, it changed right then and there. And I've never been the same since. Before I came to the basement, my life was a wreck. I was caught up in a really bad situation. I lived upstate New York. It was uh, drugs, alcohol, there was violence. Um, there was times I was scared for my life. And one day I decided I needed a uh, change in my life and I needed to get away from it all. And I packed up my things and I drove down to Alabama and um, a few months later I, um, I had heard about the basement and I decided to come check it out and I came and it totally changed my life. I mean these people, they taught me love, they taught me um, what true relationships are about, who God really is and how that He really loves me and I will always be grateful to them for, for welcoming me and making me feel special and I, I love this ministry, it's on fire, you guys got to check it out. Home, like I remember my, my mom sleeping on the floor, and me and my little brother in the bed, with my grandparent, and my grandma. Uh, when I hit 15, it got wild, you know what I'm saying? Like, me and the relationship me and my mom had, it, it just like went south hard. I moved out, uh, started hanging around the wrong people, bounced around from house to house. Uh, got the house shot at, um, caught my first court case, just cutting up for real, for real, uh, and was unhappy at the end of the day, you know, ready to go ahead and kill myself, commit suicide. And one day, like, somebody invited me to this church service or whatever called the basement. And I remember just being in there like, wow, like, God is real. Like, you can't tell me, like, that God is not real. And I remember going home and, like, sitting in my bed and thinking, like, I don't really got much, you know, I, I, a lot of people don't like me. I felt like my family had gave up on me and it was my fault. But I was thinking that what I do have, if you could use me, Lord, like any type of way, I'm down. Like if, if there's anything I could do, you know, and I got homeboys that, that's locked up. I got homegirls that's, that's people, people would say they, 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 they fight for their sanity. And I feel like if I don't go hard for them, who will? I grew up in a Christian home. I always knew God. I knew it was real, but I never had a relationship with Him. Um, I went through this phase in my life when I was about 15 years old where I just got really depressed and suicidal and I just wanted to end it. I didn't want to live anymore. Um, and then one day I went to this place called The Basement and when I was there I remembered hearing Matt speak and, and I remember the drama and it was about this girl wanting to kill herself and through that God spoke to me and was like, Susanna, I love you and I have a purpose and a plan for you and I don't want you to kill yourself. I need you here. And from that moment on, my life was forever changed. I became a new person. Um, I've been 
given the opportunity to serve with the basement and I'm on the production team and I'm part of hospitality team and I help out with Crown and my goal is to just reach that one more person that didn't have hope. I want to be able to give hope to a hopeless person. I grew up in Hoover, Alabama with a Christian home, Christian family, and my parents wanted me to go to a Christian college. Well, I ended up getting kicked out and started partying at UAB. And I'll never forget, I was in the club one night and I had a praying mom. She was always praying for me, always telling me the Word of God. And I had this moment where everything just slowed down, almost like it stopped. And something spoke to my heart and was like, is this what you really want? Do you want this? So I began searching. I knew there had to be something more. I knew there was something else that was out there. I just didn't know. I didn't, I didn't want what I had had before. And I'll never forget one night I went into my basement and I gave my life to God and I told him that I would do whatever he wanted me to do. I got invited to the basement. I met Matt and Bird and I'll never forget that first night that I came. I'd never experienced God's love. I'd never seen a team that goes so hard for God and gives it everything that they have. And I just knew I wanted to be a part. I wanted to serve any way that I could. Well, today I have that opportunity. God's given me the opportunity to do radio every night, Monday through Friday, get the chance to speak to the whole state of Alabama, let them know God's real. God changed my life, He can change your life too. And so what's good is this, is that we have the opportunity to go hard, like go hard, like give everything that you got, and that's a game changing moment for your life. You have that one time, that one moment in your, in your life where you begin to make the decision, okay God, I want what you got for me, and it changes your life forever. How many of y'all fired up to be here tonight? Somebody say, yeah. Well, let me welcome you to the basement. Those of you who are watching from around the world or might be tuning in right now, you might have just woke up. So we want to welcome you right here in Birmingham, Alabama to a thing called the basement where a bunch of people get together. And we definitely aren't perfect. We're just, we're just forgiven. You know what? It could just be one person that you affect. It could be one person that you touch. It could be one statement that you make. You know, so for some of you, the Bible, you'll be the only Bible some people ever read. But you know what's sad? Is that, man, me and you, I don't know about you, but my mom used to sit me all the time. I'd go to funeral or funeral. I remember my mom would pick me up when I was 16. I was already arrested outside of a club. And I remember my mom crying. And she said, Matt, do you not realize that eternity's real? What are you doing with your life? And I remember another night she picked me up from jail. She said the same thing. Matt, do you not realize eternity is real? What are you doing with yourself? I remember another time she picked me up from the hospital after having a drug overdose. And she said, Matt, do you not realize eternity is real? And she would say this to me, and I remember the last time I was standing in the basement of my house, and I remember my mom and dad looking at me. My mom said it one more time, and she said, Matt, do you not understand that eternity is real? And you know what? My mom used to ask me all the time. She would ask me, and I'm going to ask you the same question. My mom would ask me. She would say, Matt, would more people hear about Jesus through a pastor at your funeral than they would hear from your mouth. Is it going to take a funeral for people to come to know him? Are you going to do what God's called you to do? I'm trying to say, I guess, what can we do with this life we've been given? How can we make an impact? How can we make a difference? How can we make sure that we live our life to the fullest? And you know what, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be somebody who lives without a purpose. You say, what do you mean when you say a purpose, Matt? Well, I'm talking about in Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a hope. Plans to give you a future, not to harm you, but to do good for you. I've got big plans, God says. My name is David, I'm 44 years old, and this is the testimony of how Jesus Christ saved me from 27 years of homosexuality. I speak these things in love, not out of hatred. I speak these things out of somebody who's been there, who knows what it's like, 
who, who knows what it's like to, to live in that? Who knows how hopeless it is? Sure, you may enjoy your life. You may enjoy aspects of your life. You may enjoy the sexual aspects of it, the alcohol, what have you, but, but there's really no permanent joy in it. Eventually it goes away and you have to do more, you have to seek more. So I ask you to look for the real love, the real joy, the real contentment that can only be found in being made right with God through Christ, through Christ's work on the cross. So I speak these things from love, not, not from hate. I, I speak these things not in judgment. You know, I, I'm not judging somebody. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. The Word of God is what's going to judge us. In fact, the Word of God is what says all these things are wrong. I'm only telling people what the Word of God says. Like somebody should have told me, my friend who did try to tell me, he tried to tell me in the, in the nicest way, in a Christian way, that I was living a lifestyle that was contrary to what God wanted, not just in my, my sexual orientation, but in every other aspect. He knew, I, he knew I was not really a Christian. So I speak these things in love, and I, I pray for your soul, and I pray that you will receive these things, and that you will cry out to the Lord to save you, and to make you a new creature, because He is mighty to save, and He will save you. As I turned into my teens, we stopped going uh, quite as much. My parents started having problems, and, um, and eventually my parents divorced, and sometime later my mom remarried. And after she was remarried, we started going back to church again. And I remember being kind of glad that I was going back to church, but it was all superficial. I, I would listen to the hymns and get emotional. and. About that time, my friends started going down front and making professions of faith. And so one Sunday, I was moved by feelings and by the music and what my friends had done. And I went down front and made a decision for Christ. I didn't really know what I was doing or understand what was really taking place. I just knew something was wrong and all my friends had done it. So I felt compelled to do it. So. I walked down front and I sat down in the front pew and the deacon came over and told me I needed to accept Jesus into my heart and he told me to repeat this prayer. And I, I repeated the prayer and I remember thinking, you know, is that all there is to it? And the next thing I know he's clapping me on the back and standing me up in front of the congregation and telling me that I'm saved. And everybody congratulated me on the way out and we all left and went to to lunch, but I left there just as lost as when I came in. About two weeks later, I was just as lost when I was baptized, because I never really understood what I was doing. I never understood the doctrines of, of grace and mercy. I lived a fake Christian life for, for a while. I, I had the Christian mask that I would wear, and I would pretend to be religious, and I was probably about 16 at this age, and um, even then, sinful desires inside of me were growing. I can remember it being at church and having sinful thoughts about other people there and other, other young guys my age. And I remember just telling myself, oh, it'll, they'll go away, it'll pass away, but yet it grew worse and worse as I went along. And sure enough, it wasn't that same year when in my late 16, being 16, I actually slept with the first male I ever had an opportunity to sleep with. And I remember at first being very shamed of it and repulsed by what I had done, but yet the sinful nature of me also was satisfied in, in the pleasure of the sin itself. And as time went on, I became more comfortable with it. And I just remember thinking that it was natural, it was normal, and that I was just doing something. Be I felt that guilt because I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing at that age, but it was really because I was doing something against God. That's where the guilt came in. Before long, I got a job and I started rebelling really against my parents in pretty much every way I could. I turned to drugs and alcohol and was exposed to it at work. I wanted to try to do as much as I could as a teenager and, and live as much as I could and, and rebel against my parents without really having to rebel and move out of their house. Eventually, my parents did kick me out of the house. We had a big big blowout and I ended up leaving. 
and I tried to clean myself up a little bit after that because it was hard trying to live on my own. So I tried to clean myself up and I thought, well, I'll join the Navy, which had always been my, my dream to be in the Navy. I wanted to be a sailor. I shipped out to boot camp and as soon as I got away from my parents, that was just like adding fuel to the fire. My sin really took off. I was, had an income, I had no parental people to answer to. I only had to answer to Uncle Sam and I was exposed in California to all kinds of sins. It didn't take long before I actually got in trouble with my sins. I let the, my sins, all of them, the drinking, the drugs, the sex, get me into a, a state where I actually had to go into the hospital. And in the hospital, they ran several tests on me, and one of them was a drug test. And they discovered pretty much all my, my history of drug abuse up to that time. And, and also at that time, my, my sexual sins came out, and that was forbidden in the Navy to be a homosexual. Within a few few months time my whole dream of being uh, in the Navy as a career was gone so I had nothing left to do but to follow my my gay friends at that time they were Canadians and they were living in the States but they were being going back to Canada so I followed them and I left my parents uh, I didn't tell them where I was going I just left and went and for about two years I, I lived it up there in, in Canada and I didn't tell my parents at all where I was at, where I didn't even contact them. For all they knew, I was dead somewhere. And I remember times where I would be get very depressed and think, you know, is there nothing more to life than drinking and doing drugs and, and this sin? And I was at a party and everyone was inside and they were drinking and doing all sorts of things. And I was out on the patio of the balcony and I, I just, I was so tired of fighting in life and so tired of all of it and I was so disgusted with myself that I, I wanted to commit suicide and I told myself I could just jump off the, the balcony and 22 stories later, 23 stories later, I would be dead and there wouldn't be any, anything left. So I decided I was going to do it and I really was going to do it. I felt in my heart that I just was tired of, tired of it all. So I, I got up to the ledge and I was going to jump and right before I threw my leg over the, the ledge I remember these thoughts just came out of nowhere and one of the thoughts was there's always hope in God and I needed to find God to find that hope. And then the next major thought that really hit me was that I couldn't do this because it was wrong. It was a sin to take life, even my own life. And then the last thought I remember thinking was that I couldn't dishonor my parents this way. So I cried a little bit more and I ended up backing away from the ledge and leaving the party and I actually never saw most of those people ever again. And I continued to live my life though in, in drinking and alcohol. I didn't really clean up myself or I, I tried to but it didn't really work. And I eventually left Canada and, and went back home. I, I got caught working illegally in Canada and I got sent back to Texas. And I remember when I got back to Texas, at first everything was good. I was glad to be around my family and everything, but then I started feeling guilty for my lifestyle around them and my drinking and, and all the things I was doing. I, I wanted so badly to, to, to get away from them again. So my partner at the time, who's getting transferred and he's like, let's go to California. And I jumped at the chance to run, to get away from them, thinking that that would make me feel better. I could live my life how I wanted to. And so we went off to California. In California, things just, they didn't get any better. I wasn't a different person. I was just the same person I'd always been, just with a little bit more money now. I had a decent job. Um, I did all kinds of things I hadn't done before. I continued to decline in my sin and, and do more grievous, grievous things. I remember thinking if I could just, you know, try these other things, I, I, I would be happy, that that would make me happy, that I would be fulfilled, that I would be at peace. And even though with, I was never at peace with, with who I really was, there was always a part of me that deep down inside I, I knew it wasn't right. but I. I still wanted to pursue it. It was who I had become. I continued doing drugs and drinking and finally uh, I got really sick. I let myself uh, get dehydrated in it really bad and I ended up spending New Year's Eve in, in the hospital with the IV drip, 
getting rehydrated and I didn't realize it but at the time I had pneumonia and I left the hospital and I left there and I was really sick and the dehydration getting hydrated helped make me better for a little bit but eventually the pneumonia caught up with me and it, it ended me back up in the hospital and I just remember my my partner taking me into the hospital and the next thing I know uh, it was the next day and the doctor was coming in and she was talking to me and she said that I had the worst case of double pneumonia she'd ever seen and I was massively dehydrated and had I not been brought in that I would have died and I just remember I was grateful to God but I also remember thinking wow I'm so young and there's so many things I haven't done so many sins that I haven't enjoyed and so as I lay in the hospital the next few days recovering I mean, I was grateful to God. I did say thank you, but not in the real earnest way, in the sincere way. I was grateful that I had another chance to go out and commit sins against God, sins against Christ. So as I lay in the hospital, I planned and plotted what I was going to do first, how I was going to fulfill my lustful desires. And sure enough, as soon as I was able, that's what I did. I went out and, and lived for lust. I lived for drinking. I lived for drugs. And before long I was back in that depressed state again well about this time I I started going to a, a political action thing and there was a friend there who was a Christian and he was asking me if I was a Christian and I said oh yeah I'm, I'm a Christian I've been since I was 16 years old and he asked me what my conversion story was and I think my exact words were, what is that? And I, I really had no idea what he's talking about. And he said, um, that's the story of how God saved you. So I relayed to him my walking down the aisle at church story. And he seemed rather unimpressed and, and didn't really seem like uh, he believed it. And he kept asking me a few more questions. And after he could sense that I was a little bit irritated, he, he backed off, but not before telling me that he really didn't think I was a Christian. He knew my lifestyle, he knew I was a homosexual, and he, he was trying to kindly show me that I couldn't live in that lifestyle and be a child of, of God. I didn't understand that. My eyes were blinded by the devil. I was living in unrighteousness and I was suppressing the truth, as it says. I started listening to the radio show hosted by Todd Friel, and I remember thinking, as I was listening to them talking, he was saying something about people that that didn't agree with the Bible usually had a low opinion of Scripture. And so that got me to thinking, well, I really didn't have a high opinion of Scripture. I cherry-picked what I wanted to believe out of it. I, I wanted to believe I was a child of God, but yet I lived this lifestyle that was completely contrary to what He asked. I broke pretty much every sin there was. I had stolen. I had lied. <laughs> I probably told 50 lies every day and it never bothered me. I, I did drugs, I lusted, I fornicated, I did all these things that were contrary to what a true Christian should do. Well, I, I started paying more attention to, to the show and what he was teaching and comparing what I believed to be true to what the Bible said. And I started reading the Bible and I discovered that None of my beliefs matched what the Bible said other than Jesus Christ died on the cross. That was the only thing that really matched up to what I believed. I realized I had a God up here I was living for, a God that was okay with my sins. As it says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10, you know, there are multitudes of, of sins. I'm not trying to just harp on just homosexuality. Every sin will separate us from God. Every sin will doom us to an eternity in hell. It shows us how holy God is. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand how holy God is. We'll turn it around and look at what the Word of God says, but look at it from the backwards. An eternity, one soul's eternity in hell, paying forever. Punishment and torment will pay the wrath of God, will pay the fine against a holy God. That's how holy God is. He's infinitely holy, more than we can ever understand. And it's only Christ's righteousness that is going to save us from that damnation that's going to save us. It was about this same time that my, my partner at the time, who had, knew I was professed to be a Christian, he was always fine with it. But it was about this time that I really started reading the Bible and paying more attention 
to, to Scripture and, and comparing myself to, to what the Bible said. It was about this time that he started really being threatened by this whole thing. And he, he, really, he really fought against me studying and, and reading the Bible. In fact, at one point, he became really verbally abusive and, and started calling me all these names and, and talking about Christians and actually talking about Christ. And I remember when he, when he talked about Christ, I remember something inside of me just felt the pain of the, how wrong it was. I knew that, that he was blaspheming the Lord who had gave, given us all life. And so I'm sitting writing his words down, and little did I know that the Lord was going to actually use that to really open my eyes to, to the truth of his word. So I kept studying his word and kept listening to the radio show, and I realized that that I really was living this, this life for me, not for God. I had never really been a Christian. I, at least I didn't think I was. I thought maybe, maybe I just re- needed to rededicate my life. So I started praying to the Lord to please have mercy and, and show me the truth and, and show me you know, how to live for Him. And about this time, everything just kind of fell apart. The only, the only positive things was the Lord had taken away my desire for drinking. I no longer drank like I once did. He took away my desire for any sorts of drugs. I no longer did any drugs. I didn't even smoke pot anymore, which was really glorious. And I see now in hindsight that it was God's grace and God's mercy in, in giving me those things. And He was making my mind sober where I could be able to, to process and, and believe His truths. Once he opened my eyes to his truth, I just started delving deeper into Scripture and I realized that, that I needed to get away from there, that there was no way I was going to progress in my faith, my, my budding faith in Christ, if I stayed there in that, in that environment. So I moved back to Texas, my, my sister and my mom. I tried, to, I tried to repent to God. I tried to call out for mercy and I, I realized I wasn't saved. And I, I, I begged him to save me. But... I just wanted to keep one sin to myself. I wanted to keep homosexuality to myself. In the back of my mind, I kept thinking, well, I'll find some way to justify it. I'll find some way to make it okay. I'll find some way to do it in secret. So the Lord obviously would never save me. And I spent from September 2008 up until December of 2008 crying out to the God, to God to to save me. I prayed that He would save me, and He wouldn't save me. And I have a scripture here, actually, that He wouldn't save me until I actually repented of all my sins. I I went to my my cousin's funeral in Amarillo, and where I'm from, his wife had died, and at her funeral she wanted the gospel preached. Well, the night before, I had watched a sermon by Paul Washer called The Shocking Youth Message. And in it, Paul Washer talks about how it wasn't a matter of all we've, that we've sinned, it's that all we've ever done is sin. And I realized that was true in my life. All I had ever done was sin. I had never really been converted. I had never done anything good. I may have been nice in, at times, but I was never... I never did anything but really sin against God. My whole life had been a sin against God. And I remember him saying that Jesus died for my sins, that he bore my sins on the cross. And I remember how it sank in that my sins were what put Christ on the cross. I was responsible for his death. He bore my sins, David's sins. At this time, I I really begin to get a clear picture of what Christ was, what the cross was, and what he did on the cross. Up until this time, I'd never really understood what real repentance was, that it was a turning away from your sin, that it was more than just saying you're sorry. So up until that time, all I'd been doing was saying I'm sorry and trying to find some way to to live in my lifestyle. But now I realize that I was without hope. There was no hope for me without Christ. That I was doomed to stay in this lifestyle. I was doomed to, to, to live out in sin and then go to justice where I belong, to hell. So I cried out to God to save me. And I went to my cousin's funeral, and I sat there and 
And her last request was that one of them was that the gospel be preached. So I sat in her funeral and I listened to the gospel and I heard the glories of the cross and what Christ did. And it just sank into me right now that that, that could be me in the casket. And if it were me right then at that moment, I would be going to hell. I would be going where I deserve to go because all I'd ever done was sin. So I cried out to the Lord to, to forgive me and to just give me time to get home and to repent on my face where, the way he deserved. Later that night when everyone had gone and I was in my room alone, I got down on the floor and I confessed every sin that I could think of. I confessed my homosexuality. I confessed all my my sins against God, I, all the ones I could think of, everything. And I asked Him to forgive me for them and to help me. I asked for Him to forgive me of the secret sins, the ones I couldn't even think of at the time, the ones that I knew were sins to Him that I didn't even know about. I asked Him to please forgive me for how I'd live, forgive me from running, forgive me from rebelling against Him. Because I had always known that there was a God and that there was a Christ but I just never understood what it meant to be in Him, what it meant to be redeemed by Him, what it meant to love Him, what it meant to, to serve Him, what it meant to be forgiven, what it meant to be regenerated. So that night I prayed and I begged Him, please, to have mercy, to, to give, forgive me, to help me. I didn't know how He was going to help me. I, I didn't actually even think it was possible. To be honest, I, I really didn't believe that He could help me. I'd never heard of anyone being saved from homosexuality. I'd never heard anyone with a hope in being redeemed from it. So I just prayed, Lord, I'm going to jump into this with faith in you. Faith that somehow you will, you will save me. That you will keep me from sinning. That you will make me able to stand the temptations. To stand what may come. And... I went to bed that night not knowing if I was saved or not. But I woke up the next morning and I felt things were different. I didn't feel the guilt, the pressure of the guilt, the pressure of being under some sort of clock, the pressure of needing to make a decision, which had all been, the previous three months had all been that. They had been pressure and guilt and conviction. Now I know it to be conviction. So. I knew something was different inside of me, but I still, part of me didn't believe that I could be saved from homosexuality. I still went on and I doubted the Lord. But then I found scripture here that says that I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalms 32, 5. And I remember thinking, finally, I had, I had really repented. I, I understood what it meant to repent. I hadn't hid, kept anything hidden from him, even though nothing was really hidden from him. I hadn't tried to. I put it all out there. And that's why I felt different that day. That's why I felt different in the coming days, was because the conviction, the guilt was gone. He had lifted it because he had saved me. And every day from that day forward, I felt... I truly felt the, the desires for those things to fall away. And now I stand and wonder, two, uh, almost two years later, a year and a half later, thinking, wow, God is so good. Here I was, I, I, I didn't believe Him. I just leaped out in faith, and yet He did what He said He would do. He would take, me, take those desires away. He would make me a new creature, just like it says in His Word. He's given me a new heart with new desires. And I thank Him and I rejoice in what He has done for me. And I marveled at His goodness and His mercy to me and His long-suffering and patience. I feel compelled to, to share this scripture. I had read it before, obviously, anyone who's a homosexual and, and, and listened to preaching or read the Bible has discovered this verse before, but there was part of it I had never noticed before. It was 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 through 10 and it says do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God do not be deceived neither fornicators nor adulterers nor idolaters nor homosexuals nor sodomites 
nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. I knew that part, but verse 11 I had never known. I had never read before. And when I read it, I remember glorying in the, in the truth of it. And such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And I realized that's what happened to me. I was finally justified by Christ, and I was made a new creation. I was predestined to be a servant of His, to, to serve God. And so now I rejoice that he, He's given me that, that new heart, that new desire, the new desire to go out and to serve Him and to do His will and to, to live for Him. Sometimes I'm, I'm still tempted, but I know that there's, there's nothing wrong. There's no sin in being tempted. Even Christ was tempted. So I know that I can turn to Christ in my time of temptation. So I, I take comfort in knowing that. And I also take comfort in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I found that to be true. Every time I have rested in Christ's strength to overcome temptation, He has helped me. Every single time in every single instance, no matter what the sin was. But every time I would try to, to make do with my own strength, in, in my own strength, I fall. So I I'm not afraid of what the future holds because I know I'm, I'm made right with, with God through Jesus Christ, His Son, who, who suffered and bore the wrath, God's wrath, for me on the cross. I know that Jesus Christ has saved me from the power of sin, and He can save you too. And my hope is that anyone watching this video will turn away from that lifestyle, will turn away from their lifestyle of sin, whatever it may be, and be made right with Christ, be made right with God, and it's only through Christ, through repenting of your sins and turning from them and casting all your faith and your hope on Christ, just as I did at that time when I just leaped out in a leap of faith to Christ and He caught me. And I remember thinking how impossible it was, but yet He did it. And I stand here today, a new creature in Christ, knowing that He has paid it all for me on the cross. And I have found my hope in Him. If you're not in Christ, you have no hope. There's no hope for you. So I pray that you would please consider the truths you've heard in this video. And please consider turning your life over to Christ. Surrender to Christ. Fall at the cross and surrender all your sins. Don't suppress the truth and unrighteousness as it says in Romans 1. We all, we all do those things. I did it for many a year, even though deep down inside I knew it was wrong. Now looking back, I, I realize that, that it was wrong. And that's the repulsion I felt at the beginning of it. So I pray that that will be true for you, that you will be forgiven in Christ. Christ paid, my, my, paid for my sins on the cross, my past sins, my present sins, and the sins I'll commit in the future. There's only... Christ can do that work on the cross. We can't do it ourselves. You can be freed from your sin. You can be truly saved. You can be truly set free from the bondage of whatever sin it is that's dragging you down, whether it's homosexuality, drinking, drug abuse, adultery, pornography, whatever it may be. Christ can set you free from all those things. That's what He did on the cross. Romans 4.25 says that He was delivered to death for our sins, and He was raised to life for our justifications. That's how we become justified, through Christ's work on the cross. When heaven looks down at us now, when God the Creator looks down on us, He sees me through, through Christ, through Christ's blood. He sees Christ's righteousness imparted onto me. It's nothing that I, have, that I do or that I will do. It's only Christ that saves me. It's only Christ that can give me hope it's only Christ that can bring true joy and happiness to my life. And I don't mean in a monetary, monetary way. I mean in the way that, that brings true happiness inside with being right with God, being right with, with Christ, being a servant of Him. It's only through Christ that I felt that, that 
conviction and that guilt pass away. Without Christ, there's no hope. If you're without Christ and you're not, you're not saved, you're facing God's wrath, be it from whatever sin, homosexuality, drinking, alcohol, whatever it is, if, if you sinned one time, which we all have, you're guilty of breaking all of God's laws. So the only hope that you have is in Christ. It's Christ's redeeming work on the cross. So I, I ask you to please cry out to Christ. Cry out to God. Cry out to Him to, to open your eyes to the truth that can be found in Him, to His truths and His Word. It's only through Him, the God of this world, which is Satan, has you blinded to the truth. And it's only through God's calling to you, through God's taking the blinders off you, that you will see the truth that can be found in His Word the truth that is found in Christ, the truth that is found in the cross. And if you truly are seeking that, cry out to Christ. He is mighty to save, and He'll save you today. Jesus says that we must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. If we're not born again, we're never going to make it. We're never going to see Him. We're never going to be free from the, the bondage of sin. It's only through Christ only through that regeneration, that being born again, that we can be saved. I want to read a quote from John Newton. It says, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And what I am is an undeserving sinner saved from, from God's wrath by Jesus Christ on the cross. And I thank him every day for suffering with my, my, my running and my turning away. And I thank him every day for, for calling out to me, even when I wasn't listening, even when I was running, he still cried out to me. And I thank him for my salvation, and I thank him for Christ and what he did on the cross. And I, I pray someday that those of you listening that, that are struggling with whatever sin it may be that separates you from God, that you will cry out to the Lord to repent for repentance and, and, and forgiveness and that you will truly repent and turn to Christ. If you're not saved, you need to examine your life and see that you need Christ and that you'll never be happy with that. Baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.